All right, we've got a great interview for you guys here today. Uh, before, we've had Bernie Sanders in. Now we've got Bernie Sanders' team in. Whoa, interesting. Okay, Zach Exley and Becky Bond were senior advisors to Bernie Sanders. Uh, they've written a book uh, that's going to tell us how to repeat that success, which is awesome. Uh, and uh, I just want to give you a little bit of background on, on both of them before we get started. Becky was also political director at Credo, and uh, you and I share something in common. We both started Super PACs. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and they are, um, I believe, the only two successful progressive super PACs ever. <laughs> so, <laughs> you uh, you were co-founder of Credo Super PAC, and you guys actually defeated five Tea Party Republicans in 2012. That's right. Mm, I like the sound <laughs> of that. All right, and and Zach's worked on a couple of things like uh, MoveOn.org. Uh, he was their first organizing director. Howard Dean's campaign raised 100 million dollars for John Kerry later in that. In the general election, uh, was it a great number of titles at Wikipedia. Not only chief revenue <laughs> officer, my favorite was uh, chief community officer. Right, that's kind of cool. Yeah, <laughs> I like communities, <laughs> <laughs> and of course, work for Bernie too. Okay, you guys have written a fun little book called uh, "Rules for Revolutionaries: uh, How Big Organizing Can Change Everything." God, I hope you're right. Uh, okay, so I want to talk about the book. I want to talk about your experience on uh, Bernie's campaign. Um, first, let's start with Bernie's campaign real quick. What do you guys think was, th there's of course a great number of factors, but maybe the most important factor in your opinion for why he rose so quickly um, and, and so unexpectedly? Because then we look back on it, I don't want people to forget, when Bernie Sanders first started, he was pulling at what, 2 or 3%? Uh, Hillary Clinton was at 61%, so he closed a 60-point lead, and he had no name recognition. Hillary Clinton had the most name recognition and the most Democratic Party establishment support of any candidate in our lifetimes. So what he did was nearly miraculous. Like now we're like, oh yeah, Bernie Sanders, big, right? No, 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 Bernie Sanders was tiny before. And and so what do you guys, uh, to, Becky, let's start with you. Is it, do you think was the biggest factor in that rise? Well, Bernie Sanders had big ideas, um, mm -hmm. and Bernie Sanders had this political analysis that most voters have been waiting to hear, but rarely got from an establishment Democratic Party politician. So when Bernie started coming out and talking on the campaign trail about um, having sort of solutions that are as radical as the problems that we face in this country, that was a very big deal. And not only did Bernie have a message that resonated, he was a messenger that could be trusted. So it was Bernie's political message first that was his biggest asset, and then it was the fact that he was an authentic messenger that could be trusted. And believe, people believe that if we actually elected him, that he would follow through on that agenda in a way that they didn't believe any other Democratic Party politician would. And I was just reading this in, in Bernie's book, and, and I remember covering it when we were would, uh, when the sto that story broke, ironically for Media Matters, but a great story from Eric Bollard about how much press coverage he's, he'd gotten or how little. Uh, ABC News in the year 2015, this analysis was done in December of 2015, had covered Donald Trump for. 81 minutes in primetime news. Mm -hmm. Bernie Sanders, they had covered for 20 seconds. <laughs> it's unbelievable. Yeah. As he was doing this yeah. meteoric rise, unprecedented. They, they, gave, they gave him no coverage. Yeah. So overall in network primetime news in the year 2015, Bernie Sanders got 10 minutes. Not only did Jeb Bush, who was polling fifth, get 56 minutes, Right, because they say, "Oh, but Bernie was in second place. Of course, he's not going to get as much coverage." Jeb's in fifth place. He got fifty-six right. minutes, right? <laughs> right. Uh, but there's one other guy who got fifty-six minutes, Joe Biden, and he wasn't even in the race. <laughs> right. That's amazing. So, ha Becky, let me say with you for a second: How did he wind up rising so quickly without the media covering him at all in that pivotal 2015 year? Well, the amazing thing about this election was all the peer-to-peer -peer communication that was happening. A lot of it was happening on social media. A lot of it was happening in alternative media like your show. Because people, once they heard Bernie's message, they wanted to share it with their friends. And then once their friends heard the message, they wanted to support Bernie too. So we saw this amazing, um, we saw this amazing rise of support for Bernie as the message got out through social media and through alternative media. And it partly was because the, the message was so powerful. And there were all these clips of Bernie, not not just while he was on the campaign trail, but for 30 years, the supporters started creating these reels of Bernie talking about these same issues. 
year after year after year, long before it was fashionable or popular to do the hard and say the right thing. And so it was just this explosion that was happening through peer-to-peer. -peer. And then it was that peer-to-peer -peer network that was spreading the message that got to work to help contact the voters, to help him rise in the, in the polls um, and actually start winning uh, primaries and caucuses. So before there was fake news, there was real news. <laughs> the, the, yeah. yeah, because it got, yeah. that got spread on right. social media, yeah. and yeah. that was absolutely right. And I remember, and I've never told the story before, but when I was an anchor on MSNBC, whenever we needed a progressive point of view, we'd think, well, we could always get Bernie, right? <laughs> and if Bernie, no matter what, and he'd show up in a snowstorm, he'd be in a parking lot, uh -huh. <laughs> and, and Bernie Sanders would show up, be, not because he, for self-aggrandizement, but because he's like, no, this is really important. Right. We gotta talk about this. The Republicans are gonna do this, this, and this, we have to fight them. Yeah. <laughs> like, and so that passion came through. So, um, Zach, what do you think was, was the most important factor? I mean, yeah, I mean, I think Bernie was an amazing messenger, right? And But this is something that we've been doing. Like, and, and when I say we, I mean your viewers, the TYT Army, all these uh, people that went through campaigning with Dean, with Obama, with a bunch of other candidates. And we've we, there's this mass of people out there that have this collective experience. And e in each campaign, they bring in lots of new people and, and, and it, it's almost like a routine now, right? So when, when Bernie announced every, you know, even before he announced, people were already setting up their websites, getting their Facebook groups together. There was some new technology, like Facebook groups was actually, uh, you know, the way people use Facebook pages and groups was kind of new in this cycle. Uh, but people knew how to get together. And then when, you know, when Bernie said, okay, I wanna go do some live events, he booked these little venues and people knew what to do. They went and signed up, they drove from you know hours and hours away, and the campaign had to keep moving to bigger and bigger venues. And the reason people did that, the reason they got in their cars and went, is they knew how to hack the mainstream media. So yeah, it's about social media, but it's about using social media, and it's about just getting in your car and going and, get, and, and participating and donating, which is a drill that everybody knows now, uh, to create this story, uh, to show the mainstream media that actually we're making this guy uh, legitimate. We're gonna give him a chance. And, uh, and so even though Bernie got way less coverage than everybody else, um, he got way more coverage than I think the corporate media would have liked to give him. And, and like we all did that, you know? Uh, every, everybody who participated kind of uh, cre made Bernie into a bigger story than he was ever supposed to be. Yeah, you know, it, there's two interesting things in there. Uh, one is about uh, the rise, and, and the other is about the juxtaposition to the, the Clinton campaign. Uh, before I get to Clinton, just real quick, do you guys have stories of when you thought, "Oh my God, this is happening. We've got a real <laughs> shot." Yeah, I mean, I mean, for me, it was, it was, uh, you know, r right before Iowa, and for the next couple of months, and. And it was, I mean, you know, of course, you know, when we joined, you know, when we all joined the campaign, we thought Bernie had a shot. And, uh, but, but then it was kind of shocking how, how, just how close we got. Yeah, I mean, I would say for me, it was when Zach and I, we, we rolled into Denver, Colorado in November of 2015. And we sent an email out to Bernie Sanders supporters saying a couple of Bernie's national staffers are coming to Denver, Colorado um, to help talk to supporters about how they can help Bernie win the election. And 500 people turned out in, a, in, a, in, a, in an event organized by volunteers in a, in a rock show venue in downtown Denver. 500 people. Pe they showed up for people they'd never heard of just because we worked for Bernie Sanders and we were gonna tell them how they could help win the election. And not only did they show up, you know, with all of their crazy t-shirts that they were printing and the stickers that they had made, but they were demanding access to the voter file software called yeah. the van, which is how people ran canvases and ran phone canvases and how the Obama campaign had taught people this is how you won elections. And so they were demanding the keys to the car so that they could go out there in November of 2015 and start working to help Bernie win Colorado. That, that was when I knew something really unprecedented was happening and that Bernie could win. See, it shows you exactly what I was yelling about for the three throughout the entire campaign, which seemed to last 20 years, but, but really <laughs> yeah. was about two years, uh, which is how detached from reality both uh, the mainstream media was and the establishment Democrats. Mm -hmm. Because as you're seeing the explosion of popularity and activism on Bernie's side, ABC News gave him 20 seconds of coverage for the entire year on Prime yeah. News. It's amazing. They saw that and they're like, oh, that's just regular people. That's not important. Right, and and uh, establishment Democrats saw that. And, oh, let's not do that. 
We don't. We don't need yeah. the excitement. Yeah. We don't. Yeah. There's an <laughs> article out uh, today, which give, brings us to the juxtaposition uh, in Politico, about how uh, the Clinton uh, team uh, thought they didn't need to knock on doors, that you didn't need person-to-person -person contact, that they had these really smart consultants, um, who little dirty secret of politics get paid as a percentage of the television ads that they run. And so they kept telling Hillary Clinton, oh, you don't need to have volunteers, you don't need to have them knock on doors, just run more TV ads. And they got themselves to believe it, and it turns out they were wrong, weren't they? I mean, yeah, I mean that this this story, there's been a bunch of I mean, we you know, we were hearing a lot of this right after the election. Uh, we actually wrote a piece uh, for the Huffington Post that talked about all this anecdotal evidence that was coming in that uh, that the GOTV operation had some serious problems, and we actually got yelled at quite a bit <laughs> by people for raising these questions right after the election. And uh, and and but but more stories have come out, more analysis has come out. People from the campaign have been talking, and uh, yeah, and this report that just came out today was really pretty amazing. Yeah, and I think the thing that we don't know is that we do know that that Democratic activists on the ground in these states were saying, hey, we've got a problem on the ground, we need more boots on the ground, we need people knocking on doors, we need canvases, we need you to pay for staff to do that person-to-person -person contact. And you know what's been reported is that the campaign said no. Some states raised the money themselves. And at a certain point, we're going to find out how much money the Clinton campaign had in the bank on election day, right? How much money they didn't spend, right, to win to win the election. And and as much as we can say small things could have been done on the margins, you know, to win the election, we do have to think why was it even close in the first place, right? This should have been a 10-point race. And the fact that it was close enough for them to lose narrowly shows us that there were some bigger things that were broken, but certainly there was something fundamentally wrong with the ground game, and I think it must come back to these consultants and how the targeting was off and how they didn't include people talking to people as the foundation of their plan to get elected. So a lot of things come back to the same issue, right? So uh, I said lack of energy matters. Everybody's like, oh, no, you're just looking at it all the wrong way. No, these smart pundits on TV and the smart people running the Democratic Party, they've got it all figured out. It's all in the computer programs. I'm like, yeah, 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 I know, but people have to actually go out and vote on that day. They have to get, mm -hmm. you know, put on their clothes and it's going to be cold and they got to go <laughs> and they gotta, they're late to work right. and they got to go out and vote, right? And you have to actually excite them to vote. I, I know, yeah. I'm crazy. Yeah. I'm probably wrong about that. Yeah. But, uh, but, and but, tell them where to vote. Yes. You know, yeah. and, it, and so, but what I didn't know and what I was wrong about is that I assumed that Hillary Clinton had a great get out the vote uh, mm -hmm. campaign. I said one of the reasons, so in the beginning when I was on ABC News right after DNC, I said I think Trump might win and I, and I predicted his victory, but I said it's going to be razor thin, right? And then by the end, the polling showed that Hillary Clinton had a sizable lead in Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania. And I was like, well, and with and Colorado, mm -hmm. and, and so I'm like, without those states, Trump can't win, but it's gonna be razor thin, razor thin. And and I said one of the things that'll probably put Hillary Clinton over the top is that Trump is incompetent. And he wouldn't right. know a get out the vote operation if his life depended on it. Yeah. And I was right about that because in this political article we have this amazing fact about how Trump got 30,000 less votes than George Bush in 2004 in Michigan when Bush lost Michigan. So Trump did not excite people. I mean, remember, on the day of the election, right. Trump had an unbelievable 60% unfavorable rating. And right. he won the election. It wasn't that he was some electric figure. Yeah. It's that Hillary Clinton could not get out the vote. And and so, but I didn't know that she that her staff was going to be wildly incompetent in that, yeah. and maybe worse than Trump's. Who could have imagined that? Yeah, yeah. yeah this is so that that one fact is so important, right? Because the narrative that we've gotten from the election is that these Rust Belt voters got mobilized by this racist, xenophobic message, and you know turned out out of hatred. And there are so many Democrats, and especially so many, you know, in sort of the establishment Democrats that are just like, they're just wanting to give up, you know, they're on the American people, right? And which leads them back to the original Clinton strategy, which has been going on for decades of, okay, then, then how are we going to deceive the American people? How are we going to trick the American people to come out and vote? Because they're so racist and xenophobic. Now, don't get me wrong, white people in America are plenty racist and xenophobic, but if racism and xenophobia, 
were what were what mobilized people to come out and vote, then why did Trump get 30,000 less votes in Michigan than George Bush, right? He should have gotten more. And especially uh, when Trump actually did have this amazing message on jobs. Yeah. He really did. And that's the thing that those voters really care about in those states. And, and Trump was doing three stadium rallies a day in some of these states, uh, driving home this really powerful message on jobs. So I actually, who knows, you can't, we can't know these things, but, um, but I think this is some evidence that that actually maybe people were really turned off as we expected they would be by Trump being completely crazy, right? By basically, con you know, bragging about sexual assault and just being totally over the top on uh, immigration and all kinds of racist and xenophobic stuff. And so that could have actually kept people away from the polls. And, you know, and then if, you know, in his jobs message, actually probably helped get people to the polls. And so, uh, in, you know, what would be so great is if Democrats could take a lesson here and say, hey, maybe if we talk to the American people, all the American people, about the issues that they care about, like their means of making a living, how they're gonna get to work, uh, and all the issues, uh, then maybe they'll vote for us. You know, but she got even less votes than this loser. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and, and but he was, so I did a whole uh, segment, I did a hundred in a row for a hundred days before the election I started it called Loser Donald. Because I, because he <laughs> yeah. was. And you were right. And, and I yeah. showed it over and over again, all the different bankruptcies, every business yeah. that he Definitely. ruined. I mean, look, I'll give you a tiny, tiny example. He buys this airline, and it's yeah. a commuter airline uh, on the Northeast. And he makes gold-plated toilets and spends a million dollars per plane. <laughs> and everybody's like, you schmuck, they just want a cheap flight from New York to Boston. And then, of course, what did he do? He bankrupted the airline. He doesn't know what he's doing. Yeah. But what I didn't expect is that the Democratic side would be more incompetent. Yeah. That the Democratic Party would out-loser him. Yeah. yeah. I mean, another thing yeah. in this article is that she did not visit a single UAW hall in Michigan. Mm -hmm. They endorsed her. In the general, she didn't even, I mean, you know how hard it is to go to Michigan and not find yourself in a UAW <laughs> hall? I mean, <laughs> every event we did in Michigan was in a UAW hall and they hadn't even endorsed us. Yeah. And so, I mean, you know, it's like, it's like they went out of their way to, to tell those voters in those states to fuck off. I mean, it's just amazing. So I want to get to what the right way to do this is and that's yes. what your book oh, yeah. is about. <laughs> yeah, that's right, okay. But just real quick, one, one last thing. Look, we talked about the hubris, and I think that another article today, uh, she, they spent a lot of money and energy trying to get uh, voters in New Orleans and Chicago to vote. Why? Louisiana yeah. is deep red, uh, Illinois is clearly blue. Because they wanted to puff up their popular vote win. Oh, oh, the hubris well, of that. Well, congratulations, they did it. <laughs> right, and, yeah, well, yeah, mission accomplished, right? right. And, uh, and they're like, yeah. oh, no, don't uh, go to um, Michigan. Let's go to Iowa to try to head fake Trump. Yeah. Trump's too stupid to get head faked. He's not even paying attention to what you're doing. Yeah. And they've got all these stupid games. But you said something about how you guys wrote that article and people yelled at you. Yeah. I'm curious, what, like, who's doing the yelling? Because th there's, there's this Washington attitude. Like, right after the election, you were not allowed to criticize the Hillary Clinton team yeah. at all. That was very Reeve Gauche, right? Now, on the other hand, they came out swinging immediately. Right, oh, it was this and it was that and yeah. it was the goddamn voters and they didn't show up and it was the damn millennials and it was Bernie and it was this and oh, we would have won, we would have won if it wasn't for those rascally kids, right? <laughs> right. So yeah. who's doing the yelling? <laughs> well, I mean, I think there is a Washington consensus that, um, that we didn't do anything wrong and that if we lost the campaign given all the advantages we had and what a terrible candidate that Trump was, that it must have been some outside factor beyond our control. Right, and but when you're running a campaign, what you focus on are the things that you can control. And this was such a catastrophic collapse. It's not that they lost to someone like Mitt Romney, they lost to Donald Trump. Someone who said he's gonna round up millions of our neighbors and ship them across the border. Someone who's inspired hate crimes to spike, right? This is serious business and we have to look at how that happened without being, you know, we don't need to be mean about it, but we actually have to examine this crisis of competency in the Democratic Party that we're facing on elections, that we're facing on policy. We didn't pass the policies we needed to when we had a Democratic president in the White House that we're facing on messaging. And it needs to start immediately, right? It needs to start immediately because we have a DNC chair race um, and we have, a, we, have a, we have a vacuum of leadership because we've got to start 
forming an opposition in fighting Trump. So, you know, I think it's a, the same D.C. establishment that lined up quickly for Clinton, um, that went on the campaign, that didn't, you know, sort of like run it out at the end, you know, that was sort of focused on what were going to be their jobs in the transition, what were going to be their jobs in the White House, instead of actually doing their job and winning the race. And, and it was surprising that a lot of people were saying it's not time, we've got to grieve, you know, people that were close to staffers or people that have these recession-proof jobs in Washington, D.C., when in reality the country needs to know how did this happen and how do we start right now working today to make sure this never happens again. Yeah. Besides which, I don't believe them. I mean, that's part of why they can't stand me and I can't stand them. Uh, they were out on day one, hour one, going around saying, it wasn't us, it was everybody else. Yeah. So what happened to grieving and how you, we all needed time? It's the old Republican <laughs> right. trick, right? right? So whenever there's a mass shooting, oh, this is not the time to politicize. You don't want to talk about guns. The minute there's a, a terrorist attack, let's attack. Let's, let's invade a country right away. Right away, if you right. don't call it by its name, then we're never going to be able to solve it. Okay, now let's go to the solution. So the book is uh, Rules for Revolutionaries. That sounds pretty good. Uh, I need those rules. I'm a revolutionary. <laughs> okay, um, so you, I, you have 22 rules, right? Uh, yeah. Okay, good. Uh, hit me with um, a super important one. Well, first of all, you don't get a revolution if you don't ask for one. So this is one of the things. I that, already love it. This is one of the things that Bernie Sanders <laughs> said was he came out swinging and he said, we're going to need to have a political revolution and millions of people are going to have to rise up and get involved in the process. Um, so not just that we can elect a new president, but we can elect a Congress and we can pass all of the legislation that we need to pass to actually address the crises that we face as a country. These things that the political establishment says, it's just not politically possible. We can't do it. We can have these small incremental changes. Well, we need big changes and how are we going to do that? Well, let's have a political revolution. And if you don't ask for that, you're never going to get that. So rule one is you don't get a revolution if you don't ask for one. <laughs> okay, I, yeah, that's so <laughs> right. And and that, but like I want the audience to understand, it's it sounds simplistic, but it's so important because Hillary Clinton didn't campaign for any big change. So either that it, it did two things. Uh, one is her side, the Democratic side, it depressed them. Like oh, I, it's going to be the same system. Now you have a nice manufacturing job, and now I got to do pizza delivery, right? And so what, I'm going to go yeah. out and vote for no change, and yeah. then and for the independents who are really mad at the system, she says, I'm not going to give you a revolution. And they want change. That's why mm -hmm. Obama, he didn't mean it, but that's why he did the change placards, because he was a smart politician. Yeah. And and he used that against Hillary Clinton and she never learned any lessons from yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah, it uh, and and the Demo and the yeah and that's why we led with that rule uh, that you know it's, it's the first rule in the book. Um, it's the foundation for everything else, and the Democrats and even the progressive, the broader progressive movement has been in this spiral of self fulfilling low expectations, where they're asking people to do small things, you know, incremental change. And I mean, Clinton was like lecturing us through the campaign. That was her answer to Bernie was. Uh, don't be ridiculous. You can't do these big things. You just, you know, we just plot along with small incremental change. And then when people don't vote for that, they say, oh, people weren't even ready to fight for that little stuff. So what's their answer? Let's ask for, let's ask people to fight for something even smaller. And so people are less willing to fight. And so the whole thing gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So actually one, there's a, uh, uh, one of the frames of the book is big organizing, which is a term Becky coined, and uh, it just kind of stuck and really fit. And it's kind of opposed to the concept of small organizing. And um, this is part of where the title of the book comes from, too. It's sort of a, a, a rebuke of Saul Alinsky, uh, who wrote a book called Rules for Radicals. And uh, Saul Alinsky said a lot of great stuff, a lot of you know basic bread and butter, good organizing stuff, but. Uh, but he also was kind of selling uh, the the left and the progressive world on small organizing, and you know because it was in the '60s when when his writing came out and really made an impact, and so you know there was uprisings and rebellions and people you know really thinking big, and it was sort of you know trying to get people out of that you know and trying to get sort of people you know to to you know get into this mode of just knocking on doors one by one focusing on little local issues and sort of arguing that that's where the future was. Uh, so, so part of why we wrote this, we, uh, and there's 
21 more rules, but we'll have to hit them all in this interview. But, <laughs> <laughs> but part of why we wrote this is to really kind of shake the progressive world uh, out of that small organizing mentality. Yeah, I mean, it may seem counterintuitive, but people are actually more willing to do something big to win something big than do something small to win it's worth something your time. small. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, no, no, I tell you that it's so ironic that uh, the Republicans for so long were like, oh, Obama read Alinsky, and that's why he's such a <laughs> radical. No, it turns out he read Alinsky, and that's why he was for incremental change. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, Clinton wrote her senior thesis at Wellesley on Alinsky, actually. Oh, yeah. So. <laughs> that's so funny. <laughs> uh, it, it makes sense. And look, there's cute stories, and there's some truth into, in, in them that then get people to take the as MLK called it, the tranquilizing drug of gradualism. Mm. So uh, Harvey Milk, uh, he won not by campaigning on gay rights, but on cleaning up dog poop from the streets of San Francisco. Mm. So you get that story and you're like, oh, I get it, you go for really small stuff. No, right. but that's what people cared about. Do you see yeah. what I'm saying? You misunderstood the whole point of that story. right? And, yeah. so, and then they'll take that story and go, see, that's why you should do really, really small stuff. And, and in reality, Big ideas, whether they're the correct ones from Bernie or goofy and even corny ones from like Trump about make America great again, it turns out they fill stadiums. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And apparently win elections. Yeah. And so let's talk about more that about the future. So how do you take these rules, if you're a real revolutionary and you want that revolution, and apply it? You're gonna you know, obviously, one of the issues that you're going to run into is the brick wall of the Democratic Party, uh, who's going to tell you, try to talk you out of it. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I don't know anyone who's less revolutionary than the Democratic Party establishment in D.C. Yeah, yeah. Neither do <laughs> neither do we. <laughs> I'm not going to argue with that one. Yeah. <laughs> so, what should they do? How do they how do they fight the revolution going forward? Well, one of the things that we did, one of the reasons why we wanted to write this book and get the organizing lessons from the campaign trail in, in some form that we could share was that normally when people go on a presidential campaign, after it's over, they open up a consulting shop or they go to work for a really big DC establishment and it sort of it locks up that innovation you know, with groups that can afford to pay for it, right? And so what we wanted to do is actually so many people participated in the Bernie Sanders campaign and got to work to make change, and maybe they worked on only one part of it. But we wanted to be able to put these lessons in the hands of anyone who could pick up a book or get one from their local library and read about it and figure out how they could actually start. Because we can't wait for the big DC groups or for the Democratic Party to make the change we need to see. We need to start making it everywhere, right? And regular people can, can get together with other people in their community and get started making this change. One of the things that Zach and I were talking about just walking over here today was, you know, it's really important for people to get together in person and figure out how they can do, you know, things together. And what, a simple thing people can start thinking about now is getting together with people in their community. If you don't know other people that care about the same things you are, take a clipboard to an anti-Trump march and get a bunch of people to sign up. Invite mm -hmm. them to get together and then find out what campaigns are happening in your community. Who's running for office, you know, that supports our ideals that you can get behind and work to elect them. And if there's not anyone, decide who in that room is actually going to run for office. And then everybody else is going to form the kernel of their campaign and let's just start running and winning and let's start helping candidates that support our values and not waiting for some choice that we may not be happy about to come down from on high in Washington, D.C. So uh, we do that at, at Wolfpack um, and, and uh, I just showed a clip yesterday on the show of all these guys like howling and chanting Wolfpack in the middle of <laughs> Nebraska, Iowa, New York, Boston, etc. And, and, and it's fun and it gets you involved and we have a very specific goal. So it's not getting together just to have pizza, mm -hmm. but we are looking for a constitutional amendment to get money out of politics so we can actually fix the system. And that's my view of what the revolution is. A revolution mm -hmm. is an amendment that actually fixes the system. And so you need legislators for that, but you also need citizens that are active. One of the lessons I, I, I got, again, from the civil rights movement was the guys who started the diner protests, they were not big parts of the movement at all. They were not among the leaders. They were just students in North Carolina. But there was four of them, and they were friends, and they were willing to uh, stick by each other no matter what happened. So they're like, they pumped themselves up like, let's go sit at a whites only diner counter. Mm -hmm. No, really, should we, should we? Yeah, yeah, let's do it, let's do it. And so, and then when they got attacked and the coffee thrown on them and the clan came outside, they wouldn't move because they were in it together. 
So I think there's tremendous power in, in, in getting together. But then, you know, what people are going to say, Zach, is come on, can the local plumber or dentist or teacher really win a race for what, US Congress? No, yeah. the money people are going to beat <laughs> us. Well, how right. can I win? Well, yeah. So we so actually in the book we have there it, the 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 rules are kind of half uh, big picture stuff and half nuts and bolts stuff. And uh, and so I actually think the book would be really useful for that plumber who and their friends who want to run, and because the nuts and bolts stuff is really going to help them. Uh, and and a lot of what we talk about is how to build teams out of volunteers with no resources. Even though we were a presidential campaign, you know, Bernie kind of cheap. Uh, we didn't have resources, you know, <laughs> at the beginning. We, you know, and we were also we we need to explain that um, uh, our program, our team, it, it wound up being called the distributed organizing team, and it was really a fringe of the Bernie campaign. So we got to do all this cool experimental stuff in the 46 later states, not those first four states where all the resources go and where the field people get put on the ground and all that. So so we were running this experiment with volunteers, and in the beginning. We really had almost no resources at all. So, but we had hundreds of thousands of people all over the country that had signed up to volunteer. So, another one of the rules is get on the phone. And and so we just started calling people on this list. And you know, we would send out an email and say, "Who wants to do this job or that job? We need people to staff this team." Um, we would get people on conference calls. There's all kinds of new ways to get people on the phone. Uh, and so we'd get you know. 20, 30, 100, 1,000 people on conference calls, and we would kind of describe the jobs that we needed doing, and we would harvest people out of those calls, you know, and have people sign up, take little tests, you know, we'd give them some work to try, try them out. And then we would put teams together, and um, another rule is called uh, build volunteer teams, or what, what is that team's rule called? Sorry, sorry. <laughs> but uh, there's a rule about building teams. And we would and we would actually use all these uh, uh, commercial tools, you know, that that companies use like Slack, which is a chat room where people can get together and, in different rooms and organize conversations very efficiently. And so we would get all these volunteer teams into different rooms on Slack, and keep them organized that way. And then they could, you know, arrange and, and organize the work themselves. Um, so I think doing that kind of stuff uh, is actually going to allow uh, the plumber. To run a good campaign and get elected, and of course, when it comes to the money, we've got a chapter in there about uh, small dollar fundraising as well. I mean, look, I mean, Donald Trump being elected president shows anybody can be <laughs> yeah. elected to the highest <laughs> office in the land, right? And so, if Donald Trump, why not? You know, a, a contributing member of the community, someone who works hard for a living, knows what's up. I mean, one of the things that we're really facing a deficit of in this country is people in Washington D.C. actually really understanding what people are going through, right, in our cities and towns. And actually, one of the things that Donald Trump did well was convince people that he understood what they were going through and how bad it was. And so we actually need to bring a bunch of reality into the Democratic Party so that when the Democratic Party talks to voters and voters actually believe that they understand what's going on in our cities and towns and who better than to do that than, you know, people that are actually living that reality every day know what it is and know how to fix it. So I, I want people to understand the power of that comment because it's not that Trump didn't have any advantages. Of course, he had a big name and, and and some money and all that. But that's not why he won. He he won mainly on uh, appearing authentic. He wasn't actually authentic. I mean, he's a notorious pathological liar, right? It's a truth telling without the truth. Mm -hmm. uh, but he he appeared to be a regular guy who who didn't speak well, who wasn't polished, mm -hmm. who wasn't on a prompter. So, like. A lot of people, I think, are intimidated by the idea. Well, I'm I'm not polished like those professional politicians. I don't have that crisp suit, and I don't know how to talk like the. They, don't worry, you're not at a right. disadvantage. You're at an advantage. Yeah. Like when you go talk to people, they're gonna be like, "Oh, that guy's real. I kind of like that guy. He's not a smooth talking BS artist." Yeah. So, so we know all this stuff, and if they read your book, they're gonna have a, like literally a handbook on how to do this. Um, so what does the future look like? What, do you guys think that this this comes to fruition? Is there a change in, in a significant change in Congress? How, how does this revolution play out? 
Well, I'm optimistic, believe it or not, right? As hard as these weeks have been, I'm really optimistic. Because I think what people are recognizing is that they can't wait for somebody else to do the job, right? And they've also seen with the uh, Bernie's amazing run in the primary, even though he didn't win, they saw that if enough people got together and got to work, that we could actually almost take the presidency with this super radical socialist, you know, democratic socialist from Vermont actually almost took the democratic nomination. And had he won, I think he would have actually won the presidency and we'd be in a very different place right now. So I think that I think that what the future is going to look like is it's going to look like a lot of people who are actually ready to get to work, right? We're going to see a return to mass participation in politics. So instead of having fewer and fewer people get involved, we need to have more and more people get involved. And why I'm optimistic about this is that if we don't do it, it's clear that we're going to go further down the road of fascism. So we really don't have a chance, we don't really have a choice anymore, right? We can't sit back and deal with things going the way they've been going. It's time for everybody to get involved. And we know there's enough people uh, out there, right, who are willing to get to work. If only we give them um, a structure and we give them tools so that they can actually come into the Democratic Party or come into another party and get to work, right, that we can actually take over Congress and we can take the White House. If Donald Trump can win the White House, then surely we can take back Congress and we can take the White House. And then we can make the urgent changes that the American people need to see, right, that we can't sit on our hands and go through another eight-year administration where we don't pass the policy that solves people's problems. Yeah, and if you, you don't fight back, you're giving consent to be governed right. by those right-wing wannabe fascists. That's right. Yeah, You're saying, okay, go ahead and do whatever you want because I'm not going to fight you. And, right. and so I think uh, there's great power in that fight. And, and again, coming back to what we started with, with Bernie Sanders, if you, especially if you're young and you did not grow up uh, in the era that we did, you don't know how improbable Bernie's rise was. It, if you had said pick the senator least likely to be president, even yeah. in 2004, 2008, right, almost everybody would have picked Bernie Sanders. You right. would have said Inhofe has a better <laughs> chance, right? Right. Yeah. right? And yeah. so, like, he had no, according to everybody, no chance. Yeah. And, and if they, if he just closed in, in, in enough in, to Hillary Clinton, he would have beat Trump apparently by a landslide, the poll on election day had him winning by 12, by 12 points. That's yeah. when, Re last time we had someone win by 12 points in a presidential contest, it was Ronald Reagan and he won 49 out of the 50 states. So that's the kind of <laughs> landslide Bernie Sanders could have had and we were this close. So when t people tell you it's not possible, they don't want you to act. They're lying to you on purpose, okay? So don't believe that hype. Zach, are we gonna win? Yes, we're going to win. I mean, the thing is, is this, uh, you know, this has been going on for a long time. It's not, it wasn't just Bernie, right? Before Bernie, there was Obama, which it's hard to re remember, you know, because some of us have been really disappointed by the Obama presidency, but that 2008 campaign was a revolution. And, uh, and before that, there was Dean. And, you know, we, we don't have time to get into that whole story, but that was amazing. He was just as improbable as Bernie. And, uh, and he was you know, he was the front runner. You know, he completely messed up Iowa and came in fourth in Iowa. But until that moment, he was the assumed front runner. He had raised five times as much money as the establishment people. And so, so again, you know, there's this mass of people out there, which who includes the TYT army, the people watching right now. And we've, we've got this thing down. Like we have created this thing together. And, and I think that we need to have the confidence to use it to not just try to win back a few seats in Congress. Uh, there's no reason why we can't put together a national campaign to throw the bums out for real. People have been talking about throw the bums out forever. We actually have a mechanism now to do that because, it, because what we've learned is that if we put some you know, I was going to say red meat. Yeah, I think with your audience, I can say red meat. So <laughs> if, you, if you put something, if we put something in front of the American people that's going to be good for them, they will go for it. And we've built together, we've built these mechanisms where they can actually win. They can raise hundreds of millions of dollars. They can concentrate hundreds of millions of their dollars to, to win this thing. They can sign up to volunteer and they can be mobilized uh, using a lot of the techniques we talk about in the book and a lot of the stuff that we've all gotten good at through all these campaigns uh, to, to knock on millions of doors, call millions of people, 
Uh, we part of the the really frustrating thing about uh, losing the primary was uh, the Bernie campaign had such an amazing operation that was really just starting to bloom, you know, right there in the middle of the primary, you know, because it, it takes lead time and Bernie didn't get in right away. There wasn't a lot of uh, investment in the national volunteer operation until later in the campaign. But, you know, right when he was losing, it was so sad because it was such an amazing operation. It was, you know, calling, uh, you know, our volunteers called more than 80 million people. They made more than 80 million calls to voters. And, it, and, the, and the growth curve was just like that, right? So if we had gone in, if we had been able to bring that operation into the general, you know, we would have been calling every voter in America. Yeah, but one of, one of, the, one of the hopeful things about that, too, is that of that yeah. army of people, so many of them were young people, right? And, yeah. and by, by that, I mean, like, under 26, so like 16 to 26-year-olds. And these, these younger millennials, I mean, they are the ones that are going to lead us. And they're the ones that are going to put us over the top because they're, they really, they came of age during the financial crisis, you know, in 2007, 2008, they saw their fortunes change from going to a four-year college to going to community college, you know what I mean, to try and make it to the four-year college. They understand that they're inheriting climate change, structural racism, money in politics, and they realize that they're going to have, we're going to have to do big things to get through this. And they are willing to get to work. And so if we can take these people, and a lot of them are in your audience, and it's so great that you actually speak to people that don't watch, like, the, you know, the network television doesn't speak to this audience, but they are so ready to get to work, and they're ready to lead, and they believe in radical solutions. They want to rebuild the economy. They want to deal with structural racism. They want uh, big solutions to the immigration problems. They want single-payer health care. They get that all of these struggles are connected. We can't go for a single issue. And that they get the urgency that we have to do it all at once. And so, and they learned a lot about how to win an election. I mean, they got Bernie from 3% name recognition to 46% of the delegates at the Democratic National Convention. And then they even pragmatically turned out in huge numbers for Hillary Clinton, even though they, she wasn't their candidate. So they're ready to go and they're ready to lead. And, uh, and we're excited about working with them because I think that's going to be a big part of the change we're going to see. So Donald Trump uh, won by lying about the jobs he's going to create. Can you imagine what yeah. we would do if we were just telling the truth yeah. about the jobs we're going to yeah. create? <laughs> yeah. So and uh, had an actual plan instead of just saying, "I'm going to build beautiful factories in your town." But what about you? What if you imagine if you had an actual plan to do to actually rebuild the economy? Exactly. Yeah. So uh, I know that in some ways it's frightening times, but it's also exciting times. So. Uh, it, it seems like our darkest hour in a lot of ways, but I, I believe we're about to have our finest hour. And I think that you guys are going to make that happen, and, and I think you guys are going to make that happen. So thank you for coming on here and telling people how to build a revolution. Becky Bond and Zach Exley, and the book is called Rules for Revolutionaries, How Big Organizing Can Change Everything. So let's go do it together. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.